All right, Psalm 37. <clears throat> Excellent Psalm. I'm glad that we read the whole chapters before we start because there's so much content in this chapter that's just amazing. And this is one of those great chapters when you're down or depressed that can help uplift you. A lot of people like looking to the Psalms for a little bit of lifting up. <coughs> Excuse me, when they when they fall on hard times and when they're going through problems. And hopefully that's not the only time you're cracking open the pages of your Bible, but that you're reading your scripture every day. But when you do go through those hard times, there are lots of times because David fell on lots of hard times and he is continually going to the Lord with his problems. And that's what we need to learn to do. And what I'm preaching on tonight is understanding God's timing in our lives. Everybody faces troubles. Everybody goes through trials. Everybody has hard times. We need to understand that we're on God's timeline. And there's only so much that we can do. And we need not to fret ourselves. Look at verse number 1. I love how this psalm starts off. Verse number 1 says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. So right off the bat, God's saying, Don't worry yourself. Don't, get, go, don't fret don't be concerned with all these workers of iniquity. Don't worry about them when you see them prospering. Don't worry about them when you know that they're extremely wicked, yet everything seems to be going right for them. Don't fret. Don't be concerned. Don't worry about the evildoers. And he says, don't be envious against the workers of iniquity. You see the, the movie stars. Many of them, you see the, the lifestyle that they live. You see them partying. You see them with women. You see them exchanging wives. You see them doing all of these things with their life, yet they continue to succeed. Yet their, their, their movies are number one blockbuster hits, and they continue to just have all of this wealth and prosperity. They seem to be going well, and a lot of people these days will be envious of that. And they'll think of, oh, how miserable my life is. And if only I had the life of one of these celebrities and how great it must feel to have everybody love me and look up to me and, and make all this money and be financially secure and everything else. Don't be envious. God hasn't given that to you. You need to be content with the things that you have. But we also have to understand that they're evildoers. And their end will come. God is a just judge. Just because you don't see it happening immediately doesn't mean that judgment does not come. Look at verse number 2. It says, For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. They will get cut down. They may seem high and lofty right now, but their time will come. Be assured of that. But these things come in God's timing. There are times in our life when we can get very stressed out. Usually this happens when there's these big events that, that have a big impact on our life. It may be financial problems. It may be health problems. It may be relationship problems or others. For example, you might lose your job. Very big deal, especially if you're supporting a family. You lose your job and you're, you're under this great, tremendous amount of stress because you know it's your duty. You need to provide for your family and you've just lost your job. And, and the world can feel like it's crashing down upon you and you feel the stress just bearing down on you. This is an example of something that can happen and we don't understand always why these events happen. The foolish thing to do is to look to God and blame God. God knows that we have need of things and He will take care of us, but we have to understand that it's all in God's timing. Sometimes He allows us to go through these difficult times and these times of turmoil and persecution, but it's for our own benefit and it's going to bring us through. The Bible says that when we're tried, we'll come through like gold. Yeah, like fine gold of Ophir. Maybe it's not something as with your finances that comes along, but I think of even the, the situation that, that my family is in with my wife. And unfortunately, my wife's not able to, to be here tonight. But um, I'm going to have her listen to the video of this sermon because this is, this is very much has to deal with her as well. There, she, she's pregnant 
and about to have a baby, but she's gone a little bit overdue. And now we're waiting. We're waiting on God. We're waiting for this baby to come and everything's going along just fine. But I know the way that she feels. I know the way she's expressed and the, the pain and the discomfort and all the things that she has to deal with. And you start to question why. Why won't this child just come out? Why can't I be delivered of this child? And you start to wonder and ask these questions. But we have to be able to trust and not get so overly stressed and concerned. Now, all of these things are concerned that I mentioned. You have a concern over your job. Yes, it's a healthy concern. You need to be concerned over that. You need to be able to provide for your family. We need to be concerned with the health of ourselves and of our children. We need to, to, to be careful and watching over that. But we also need to be able to take comfort and not let these things either bring us down or make rash decisions or do something foolish because we get impatient and we want to force something to happen that we need to be patient for. Let's keep reading here in Psalm 37. The Bible reads in verse 3, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. My example of someone who might lose their job and worried about how am I going to feed myself, how am I going to put food on the table, the Bible says, trust in the Lord and do good. You're doing what's right by God. You're trusting in God. He says, verily, truthfully, of a truth, God tells you, you'll be fed. You're doing what's right. You're trusting in me. You're putting all your trust in the Lord. You'll be fed. You don't have to worry about where your food's going to come from. God will work something out. Oftentimes, see, when we, we gain the experience, when we go through these hard times, and then you can look back, and it's a lot more clear to see how things happened in hindsight. And the older you get, the more you experience this, and hopefully the more comfort and solace you can take in God. But try to make it so that even if you're young, that you don't have to go through the experience, but you can just start trusting in God from an early age, knowing that there are many of those who have had the experience and that can tell you firsthand, this is the way it is. But even more importantly than that, you can read the Bible and trust the promise of God that He says, if you trust in me and if you do good, you will be fed. That is not a concern that you need to be all worried about. Verse number 6, or 5, excuse me. Or no, 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. He says, if you delight thyself in the Lord, if you're happy about doing the things of God, if you're doing what's right, He'll give you the things that you want. It's a very simple formula. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. To pass, excuse me. Trusting completely in God. This is great faith that we need to have. And the, the times when we need that great faith the most is when we're going through the hard times and the troubles and you start to get scared and afraid and wonder what's going to happen. But we need to commit our ways unto God. Verse 6, And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. There is a great rest in God, in knowing this. It's, it's, it's just a faint memory that I have. But I could remember as far back as I can. I, I don't have a great memory of when I was younger. But I do remember the feeling of security and the feeling of everything being okay and right in the world when I was in the arms and being held by one of my parents in my mother's arms and my father's arms as a young child and just that overwhelming feeling of protection and love and comfort and knowing that I have nothing to worry about because I'm with my mom or I'm with my dad. That's something that, that it's easier felt as a child. You're not thinking about when you're a child. You're not thinking about 
How are the how are the bills going to get paid? How am I going to get clothing? How am I going to get food? How am I going to get do this and do that? And all the stress and the work that builds up as an adult. But I believe that we can have that same sense of comfort and security that a child feels with their parent when they're really, really young and there's so many things they don't understand yet that we can have that same rest and comfort in the Lord if we have enough faith. If we could just know that God is there to look out for us. We know that, yes, I'm doing what's right. I'm, I'm trying to follow God. I'm reading. I'm, I'm soul winning. I'm, I'm praying. I'm doing these things. I'm putting God first in my life. I'm not letting anything come between me and God. Why are all these bad things happening to me? The Bible says, rest in the Lord and be patient. Wait for Him. Just because you think need, things need to be handled right now in this moment because you're going through hard times, wait for God's timing. Wait on Him. Trust Him. Know that He knows what's best and that maybe He's not stepping in now because it's not the right time. You may think it's the right time, but God doesn't think so. He says, Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Verse number 8, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. He's saying, don't let these, these situations cause you now to go out and do evil and to, and to stop waiting on God and take matters in your own hands. Saul had that problem. We'll get to that in a little bit. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. There are people in the, in the Bible that, that didn't wait for God. They didn't wait for His timing to do things and caused problems upon themselves. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 9 of Psalm 37. For evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Abundance of peace. Man, what... When you're, when you're going through problems and struggles and you feel the weight and the stress and the pressure coming down on you, oh, what a calming, what, what a great satisfaction to feel that, that feeling of peace come over you and that feeling of peace that we can have by being meek, by being humble, and trusting in God and waiting on Him. Jump down to verse number 23 of Psalm 37. Excellent verse here, Psalm 23, Psalm 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. That alone ought to give you comfort when you're going through the hard times, whatever it may be in your life. If you can say, you know what, I am a good man. I'm not perfect, I'm not sinless, I'm not lifting myself up. But at the same time, I know, hey, I'm saved. I am trying my hardest to do what God has for me to do. I'm, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time with God and trying to do what's right. And do I slip and fall sometimes? Yes, I do. But if you can say that, I believe you can say you're a good man in the context of this verse. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. God is setting up your steps before you. That is comforting. Where else would you want to be than in the very steps that God has lined up for you to take? You may not be able to see what your next step is even going to be. You may be worried about the problems that you're having. But if you could take comfort in this, in this psalm and just know, hey, I'm trying my best to do what's right, God. There is nothing else I could possibly be doing right now. I'm just going to have the faith to know as I keep walking that my steps are ordered by you. And I'm not going to worry about it so much. I will be trying my best and giving the concern appropriately to make the right decisions and to do what's right and not to forsake God and to be making wise decisions. But I'm not going to let this, this bear down on me and cripple me under the pressure. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. 
Though we fall, because we will fall, a good man will fall. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. Look at this. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. So I know you're going to stumble. I know you're going to fall. But, but even when that happens, even when you hit the hard times and you stumble and you fall down, God is there to lift you up. God is there to help you up and to make you go, to help you go that extra mile, to push you and give you that extra strength as he gave Elijah. He says, look, I need you to eat this meat. You've got this long journey in front of you. And he was, fell down on his face and he, was, and he wakes him up again. He sends the angel, look, you need to get up. You need to eat this. This is going to sustain you to get you through. And he gets him through just enough. Just like he sends them to the woman with the, with the oil and the meal and, and the oil never fails. And the meal and the barrel never fails. They have just enough to get by and they're relying on the Lord. He miraculously takes care of them. The same way that he fed the children of Israel with manna in the wilderness. He's there to lift you up and to help you go that extra mile, to help you continue through, to find that extra strength There's no reason to despair. No matter how bad you things are, things are to you, no matter how much pain you may be experiencing. If you're doing what's right by God, even when you fall down, He's not going to cast you down. He's not going to utterly cast you down. He's going to uphold you with His hand. Verse 25, I have been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. God doesn't forsake his children. You may go through bad times, but he's not going to forsake you and we could take comfort in that. Let's jump down to verse number 34. Psalm 37 verse 34 says, Wait on the Lord and keep his way. And he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he cannot be found. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace." Now we've seen a lot of verses here talking about the good man, the righteous, the one that's doing. If you want to have God's strength and if you want to have God helping you at all times during these times of your troubles, make sure you're doing what's right. So much more the reason not to be getting involved in sin because oftentimes what happens when you're getting involved in sin, you're going to end up reaping what you sow. And while yes, God will not forsake you, He's never going to utterly cast you out, because you're his child, he may allow you to go through a lot more and you may have to, to be going through a lot more problems than he will, that, that'll cause him to not help you out in the way that you might be expecting him to. Verse 38, But the transgressor shall be destroyed together, the end of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in Him. Flip over backwards a little bit to Psalm 27. It's a few pages back to Psalm 27. Psalm 27 in verse 13, right at the end of the psalm. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. We need to understand God's timing. You may not always be able to know what His timing is when you're going through things, but we need to keep it in heart that we wait on Him. We're relying on Him. Let's wait on Him. You don't have to have the answers to everything. 
You do what you know is right, and you keep doing that. And when, with everything else that's going on, you just wait on God to take care of those things. He'll make it clear. He'll, if He's ordering your steps because you're doing what's right, hey, He'll get you through it. We see the despair. I had fainted unless I had believed. It's that faith, that belief that can get you through, that can cause you not to faint, not to, st not to fall, not to, not to be over, with over much stress and pressure coming down on you. You see, when there's a lot of, why am I going into this so much? Because when there's a lot of stress, there also tends to be a lot of emotion involved with that. When things aren't going well, j just the pressure itself of that stress that's building on you can, can cause you to, to not be in a very good mood, of course, but, but you start getting a little bit more emotional about things. We need to be able to know how to make wise decisions under a lot of stress and emotion. Making the emotional decision is almost always the wrong decision. When you allow yourself to let emotions take over, usually you're going to make the wrong choice. Usually you're going to do something foolish. You're not going to do something wise. Why? Because you're not thinking it through clearly. You're acting on impulse. You're acting as a, as a knee-jerk response. A knee-jerk response to someone reviling you would be to revile them back. When someone gets at you to go get them back. That's just the knee-jerk response. That would be the emotional response. We need to keep a level head and know when these things happen to, to take a step back and say, well, wait a minute. I may be extremely offended. I may be extremely hurt. I may have suffered loss. I may have had these things happen, but I'm going to make the right decision based on God's word. And I'm going to wait on him. And I'm going to let him right the wrongs. <clears throat> Under a lot of stress and emotion, a common problem that can occur is fear. Fear will cloud your judgment. Unless you have the fear of the Lord, it's a proper fear. Any other fear, you fear other things. You fear, you're fearful because you lost your job. You're fearful for all a variety of reasons that can cause you to make the wrong decisions. Elizabeth, sit up in your chair. This is important. There's some examples of the Bible, in the Bible, of people that, that made decisions based on fear, and they were very bad decisions. Turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 26. We see an example. We've already been through this on our Wednesday night Bible studies. But in Genesis chapter 26, in verse number 7, let me get there myself. We see one of the story of Abraham. And he goes to Gerar or excuse me, of Isaac. Abraham did the same thing. But this one in particular is with Isaac. Abra Abraham had the same exact situation happen for the same exact reason. But this reference is with Isaac. It says in verse 6, And Isaac dwelt in Gerar, and the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, She is my sister. So he lies. He goes there, he's married, and the men of the town are asking, hey, is, you know, who, who is this, this woman with you? Because she was attractive, she was beautiful. And he says, oh, she's my sister. Look what it says, so keep reading. She's my sister, for he feared to say, she is my wife. He was afraid. He was afraid to say that she's my wife. Why? Lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah. Because she was fair to look upon. She was beautiful. So he was afraid. He was worried that the men of that place were going to kill him. So what does he do? He lies and says, oh yeah, she's my sister. As if that's a good solution. It, it, it's not. It's a terrible solution because what happens then is that now the men of the city are going to want to marry her. They're going to want to lie with her. They're going to want to take her because there's no reason why they can't. If, he, if, if she's just his sister, then why can't they? 
And this shows the lack of faith that Isaac had, even though he was doing what was right. He was in God's will. He was, he was walking his ordered steps. And as we see in Psalm 37, we could have that faith and know and trust that, hey, God's going to take care of me. God will protect me. God will see me through. I have no reason to fear what these men are going to do to me. But uh, obviously you could say, well, that's easier said than done. I know it is, but that's why I'm preaching this sermon tonight because you need to be strengthened. We can find the strength to have this type of mentality if we get that strength from God's Word. We can see these examples, and when we are faced with such a thing, it's not impossible to not fear these people. It's not impossible to have that faith in God. Sometimes it may seem difficult but it's not impossible. We need to keep these things in our memory that God is with us and we have no reason to fear. Now, thankfully, God was still looking out for him. And even though he may have stumbled in his faith here, God held him up because his steps were ordered, because he was doing what was right. But what happened is the men of the land, hey, they called her and they were going to take her to wife. If God didn't step in. And Abraham did the same exact thing with Sarah. Out of fear, he said, oh, she's my sister, not my wife. And it was a foolish decision. But they let that fear cloud their judgment. Their judgment should have said, God's with me. God told me to sojourn in his life. God told me to go here. He's not going to tell me to go somewhere so that, my, so that I can be killed and my wife can just be passed off to some other man. But the emotion, the fear took over and he made a poor choice. 1 Samuel 15 is another example. 1 Samuel chapter 15. I'll give you a minute to get there. Fear will cloud your judgment. You're not going to be able to make the right decisions when you're afraid. 1 Samuel 15 and verse number 24. This is um, just to give you a little context here. Saul was waiting for Samuel to arrive to perform the sacrifice. Oh, no, excuse me, that's not what this one is. Let's just read, I'll get you, let's get the context of this chapter. Starting in verse number 1 of, of 1 Samuel 15. We'll get this whole story. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. We'll get the, the context of this story here before I jump down to what he did. The Bible reads, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him, in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. The instructions are very clear to Saul. Samuel says that God is going to take vengeance now upon Amalek. It's come into remembrance what they had, the wickedness that they had sown when they came against the children of Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness and they were going to go into the promised land. How Amalek came against them and he says that their, their sin has come up in remembrance. Now I want you to go and you're going to bring judgment against this land and you're going to destroy the men, the women, the beasts, all of it. Kill all of it. Yet They're going to be wiped out by the judgment of God. So Saul goes and, and he goes to, to battle against the Amalekites. And it says in verse 7, and, and Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. Did God say to take the king alive? No. His instructions were clear. He said, kill men, women. He says, kill all of it, kill the animals, kill everything. But he took the king alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. So 
He did everything. He, he killed the people, but not the king. One man left. Even you say, well, it's just one person. It's still disobedience to God's word. It's still disobeying what God wanted. Verse 9, but Saul and the people spared Agag and, so it wasn't just him, the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and of the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. So they decided to take things into their own hands and say, you know what? We're not going to kill all this good. I mean, this is, this is good oxen. These are good sheep. Why should we just slaughter them and kill them? Because God said so. But Saul didn't do that. He kept the king alive, and then he kept the best of the, the, the sheep and the cow alive. Verse 10 says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. So God speaks to Samuel, and, and, and God just basically saying, You know what? I'm fed up. I wish I hadn't even made Saul king now, because he's already not following what I said for him to do. Samuel goes to confront him now. Verse 12, it says, And when Samuel rose early, in the, early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. So here we see Saul thinking, well, I did everything God told me to do. How's it going? How's it going, Samuel? Everything God told me to do, I just did. Which is not true at all. And Samuel's going to rebuke him here. Look at verse 14. And Samuel said, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen, which I hear? He's like, then what, what are the sounds of the animals I hear, Saul? You did everything that God commanded you, huh? Why do I hear these animals? Verse 15, and Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. So you say, no, 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 you don't get it. See, they took the best so that we can offer them up to God and give it all to God. Is that what God told you to do? No. But he's still trying to justify his sin. And he's, he's arguing with Samuel, saying, no, 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 no. See, you don't get it. What we did was we brought this stuff for the Lord. It's for God. I did what's right. The excuses start coming out. Verse 16, then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own, in own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? But didst fly upon the spoil and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 20. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag the king of Amalek and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. The stubbornness and the rebellion of Saul we see very clear in this story. He continues to justify his sin and saying, no, I have served God. I have done that which is right. And Samuel is saying, no, you haven't. But he's, he, now he makes up this excuse. In verse 21, he says, but the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. So now he's trying to pass off the blame on the people saying, well, I slew all the Amalekites and I just brought the king back. But the people, they took the best of the flocks and brought them back to, to make a sacrifice unto God. Verse 22, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? He's saying, do you really think, do you really think that it's going to make God happy that you disobeyed His commandment in order to offer up some sacrifices to Him? As if God needs that burnt sacrifice. Or that pleases him when you bring a burnt sacrifice that was, that was gotten 
in direct opposition to what he told you to do. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. We can apply that even today. Think about you know, the money that's put into the plate. right? You might make this great sacrifice and you feel so good about, oh man, I'm, just, I'm, giving, I'm making this great sacrifice, it's financial, I'm throwing all this money in the plate. Hey, but if you're just disobeying God's commands and just going out, just living, God doesn't care about that money that you're throwing in the plate and I don't care about it either. It doesn't mean anything. To obey is better than, than sacrifice. The sacrifices that you give. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like the Catholics, they go through their period of Lent. And they feel like, oh, I'm giving this up. I'm, I'm, I'm sacrificing this for God. As they go out and, and booze it up on Fat Tuesday and party it throughout the, the whole time anyways. And they're just a bunch of drunkards. Yet they feel like, oh, I've sacrificed this so much. And look, I know now all Catholics are drunkards, but the people that I've known that participate in Lent go out and just do all kinds of other wickedness and they don't even care about what God's commands are, but they feel like they're doing this great sacrifice. They have a Saul mentality. Verse 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord he hath also rejected thee from being king. But now we see here in verse 24 which brought me into this whole story and we we're talking about people making bad choices based on fear because they're afraid and they choose to do things that they shouldn't be doing because they're afraid. Verse 24 and Saul said unto Samuel I have sinned. He finally admits it that he's done wrong, by the way. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words. Why? Look what he says. Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Saul didn't have the proper fear of God. He feared the people. He feared what they might say when he says, No, we're not bringing these, the best of the, the flocks back to sacrifice unto God. We're destroying them all because that's what God said to do. He feared what they would think, what they would say, what they would do. And that fear led him into sin. Don't let fear of other things that happen in your life cloud your judgment. Don't try to stamp out whatever fears you have. Unless it's a godly fear, it's a fear of the Lord. We ought not to be afraid of man and what man can do unto us. We ought not to be afraid of even other situations in our life that come up that seem to be such that we don't even know how, to, how we're going to get through it. Don't let that cause you to fear. People oftentimes will fear when it comes to their health. You're worried that that you're going to die or a loved one's going to die and, and, and they, they tend to, in my opinion, make foolish decisions on their treatment. Because when that actually happens, you're willing to do anything just to get better again. And, and you'll end up taking, you know, like radiation and chemotherapy and people get cancer and they get treated with this stuff and those treatments end up killing them way worse and way faster than if they wouldn't have even done anything at all. But there's other things that you can do. But the, what happens is people get, get afraid. And I know this, I, I know it's a difficult thing to go to. And even when you're, if you were to get diagnosed with something so serious, to be able to look at the evidence and make a, make a rational judgment without being so afraid of what's going to happen and, and, and say, is this really the right, the right treatment? Is there something else out there? Is there something else I could try? I don't care if, if the big pharmaceutical industry is saying that, that anything else is just, is just hogwash and it's not going to work. Look, there's a lot of people out there trying to make money in the industry. We need to just, you need to be able to, to make the best decision. And if you can look at the evidence and say that that's the best way to go, fine, whatever. The sermon's not about that. It's about not letting the fear cloud your judgment so that you make 
poor choices. Having patience and faith that God is directing your steps will help comfort your soul and will actually relieve that pressure that you feel that comes down upon you. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Let's look at the attitude that we ought to have in regards to just eating and clothing ourselves. Very popular portion of Scripture. God tells us how much we ought to be thinking and concerned and stressed out about these things. And I'll be the first to admit, as a father of a family who has a mediocre income, it's stressful trying to meet the needs and, and keep everyone fed. But I can take this to heart as much as anyone. But it's so much important. It's so important to, to be able to rely on God for these things. Let's read in Matthew 6, verse 25, what the Bible reads, what Jesus Christ himself said. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. He said, don't think about these things. Don't worry about that. Life is about so much more than the clothing that you put on and even the food that you put in your mouth. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap. They're not working for their stuff. Nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? He's saying, God gives this fantastic clothing unto the grass of the field. These beautiful flowers that have, that have more beauty and color in them than even Solomon was able to possess in his kingly array. But the grass grows up, it dies, it withers, and you throw it in the oven and it gets burned up for nothing. He said, if God is willing to clothe the grass so well, how much more are you how much more important are you? Verse 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We don't need to let ourselves get so stressed out and so worried about what's going to happen tomorrow and what's going to happen next week and my job and I'm not making enough money and how am I going to make all this stuff work? He said, don't worry about it. Focus on the things of God. Work for the Lord. Do what's right. Be a good man so your steps are ordered. God will take care of those things. Those are little things. It's no big deal. Jesus fed thousands, the 5,000 with the five loaves and two fishes. He gives us these stories for a reason to say, look, God can make any of these things happen. As I mentioned with Elijah, and with, the, with the lady and with the, the food that just doesn't fail and, and even with the, the ravens that brought Elijah the food and he, he was drinking out of the brook. God can take care of you. Just make sure you're doing what's right by Him. Don't allow these occurrences in our lives to take such so much of your attention that all of a sudden you're not able to, to do God's work. You're not able to put the time forth that God would have you to do. Turn if you would to James chapter 1. I'm going to 
briefly just cover vengeance. It's another thing that we need to wait in God's timing for. God's timing, not our own. We don't need to take matters into our own hands. We don't need to right every wrong that comes our way. God takes care of it, but he takes care of it in his time. Proverbs 20:22 20, reads, Say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. Wait on God. God will take care of it. David continually was going to God, and he was waiting for God. When Saul was chasing him and all these people were after him, he's waiting on God and praying, God, deliver me. God, deliver me. God, help me out here. God, save me out of the hand of these evildoers. And God did. God did not forsake King David. He died an old man. A very old man. Another area where we need to, to rely on God's timing is for wisdom. Here in James chapter 1, we're going to see where it tells us that we can ask God for wisdom and He'll give it to you. But don't get discouraged. Don't get down when you just aren't understanding certain things from the Bible. You can't understand everything all at once. I don't even understand everything in the Bible, and so much, nobody does. Nobody understands everything. But we need to be praying to God and asking Him that He would give us. As James chapter 1, look at verse number 2, the Bible says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. You're saying we're in troubles? Rejoice over that. When you're having problems, rejoice because you know what? When your faith is tried, you're going to learn patience. You're going to learn how to deal with this patiently. But let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. It means you're lacking nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Look, you want to be, you want what, wisdom? God will give that to you in abundance. He says he'll give it to you liberally. But go to God and ask. It says, but let him ask in faith, knowing that God's going to do this for you. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. God will, God will give, he promises here, God's going to give you the wisdom that you want. But you have to remember it's going to come in his timing. Don't be impatient about understanding, especially particular passages in the Bible. I know a lot of times people just, you, you, you get under your skin and you're like, what does this mean? I want to know what this means. And you start looking it up. You start looking up all these different people and, and these YouTube preachers and all this other stuff. And you say, I just want to know what this says. And when you rush to the internet to find out an answer, you're going to find a lot of false prophets out there who can get your mind kind of screwed up. You introduce a little bit of leaven and all of a sudden, the whole lump is getting leavened because you're, you're, you're not waiting on God to open up your understanding, but you're going to false teachers. Now look, I put my videos on YouTube and other people put their videos on YouTube. I'm not against it altogether, but what I'm saying is it's always best to learn things on your own anyways. Pray to God. Study the Bible. If you don't get it right away, just keep Keep reading and keep thinking about it and, and keep asking God and God will give you that knowledge that you're looking for. You don't have to find it even through anybody else. Whatever your cares are, whatever problems may arise, it all boils down to relying completely on the Lord and trusting that He knows what's best, that He can see the future even though we can't. When things feel like there's no way out, God can provide a way. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had no way out. But they were doing what was right. They weren't going to bow down to any images, any graven images, any false gods. To them, it seemed impossible. There was no way out. But they waited on God. They said, I, we know our God's able to deliver us. They had that faith. They trusted and relied completely with their whole body, soul, spirit, and mind in the Lord. And just said, you know what? We're not careful to answer thee in this matter, O king. So we're not going to bow down. You go ahead and play your music. We're not going to do it. 
Go ahead and throw us in the furnace. God can save us. We know He can. We have full faith that God can save us. But if He doesn't, you know, if He decides not to, that's fine too. But we're not going to bow down to your false god. And of course, God does save them. God sees that they have no harm whatsoever because God is a God that performs miracles. God is a big God. We need to make sure we're doing all we can to serve Him and pray to Him and not let these other problems steal the focus of our lives from serving God. The same way that we entrust our souls to Jesus Christ for our salvation, we completely trust Him with our souls, saying, you know what, I believe so much, I'm not going to believe on anything else but you, Jesus Christ. What you've done is enough for me. Here's my soul. You can... I'm trusting it to you that you are going to save me. You are my Savior, dear Lord. I am not trusting myself one bit. That same level of trust for our souls, we need to be able to trust God with all of our cares. Everything in our daily life. Not just our eternity. Know that He is good and faithful. Even when things don't happen exactly when we would like them to or necessary in the way that we would have them to go, God is looking out for us and knows what's best for us. But we need to make sure that, we, that our steps are ordered. The only way you're going to know if your steps are ordered is if, is if you're doing right, if you're, if, you're, if you're a good man. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for such an encouraging psalm, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to remember this psalm when we go through our struggles and, and our hard times and that we can wait on you and have the patience just to wait. Just to wait. And not force an issue and not, and not act on fear, dear Lord, but that we can just wait and patiently, faithfully trust that you'll see us through. You'll provide an answer. You'll provide us clothing. You'll provide us food. You'll provide things for us because of your promises and your word, because of what you said you would do. We have full assurance that you can do those things, dear Lord. Help us not to, to sway from that or stagger from that, dear Lord, and, and to remain confident. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.